Uh, welcome to my talk about uh, gothic romance of the 60s through the 90s. Um, I'll just start by telling you a little bit about my book and how I came to write it. I was fortunate to have a sabbatical from my college um, in 2015. And since I've been a gothic romance fan pretty much all my life, it seemed obvious what I should tackle as a project. And I also realized there really wasn't a good critical study of this genre. Uh, romance studies, as you might know, are just starting to come into their own. So there are some critical studies of Harlequin, Mills and Boons, historical romance, Regency romance, some of the bigger names, and so on. But there was really nothing about the Gothic romance. There is a bit being done now with pulp fiction. Um, so this was kind of a, I think a natural extension of, of those types of studies, popular culture studies. So I'm going to start by just going through a little bit of chronology, um, sort of recapping the beginning of my book and then we'll get into the meat of it, which is the popular romance of the 60s and early 70s. So the first thing I'd like to point out is the use of the term Gothic. Um, and since we're all Gothic fans, uh, we all know that this word is used in a myriad of different ways. But one thing I thought was interesting was when it refers to Goths and Vandals as in the barbarian tribes uh, that destroy, supposedly destroyed classical civilization and art, um, there's sort of an echo of the way the Gothic novel was later insulted and accused of, you know, um, destroying great literature or posing as, as good literature, um, corrupting people's reading tastes and that kind of thing. Um, by the 18th century, the word Gothic had come to refer to people who were a little bit eccentric who liked tacky things. Uh, for example, uh, Horace Walpole had a, a castle um, built out of pretty flimsy uh, paper mache type stuff. And it fell apart, as you may know, if you studied his life at all. Um, and, and that's sort of the, the attitude that the 18th century had toward Gothic. It was, it was sort of an object of laughter. That all started to change when the novel came into its own. And as you know, the novel gained great popularity in the 18th century because of a variety of social factors, ease of printing, um, distribution, increased literacy, more leisure time, uh, especially for women of middle to upper classes. Um, and, you know, the women readers were kind of a new uncharted territory for literature. Um, they had a lot of leisure time if they were of the appropriate social class and, and they would al almost have to be to, to be literate. They needed something they could do indoors. They needed something that was genteel, not embarrassing. You know, they couldn't very well go out and play sports box, ride horses, things like that. So this was a respectable form of entertainment. It only makes sense that some of the novels would have started to be pitched toward women's reading tastes. And that's why you get a number of novels that start to center around domesticity, marriage, courtship stories, as opposed to things like, you know, action, adventure, war, travel, things that women didn't really participate in in those days. So the early gothics are kind of divided between horror and romance. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the castle of Otranto, the monk and some other stories like that. Um, the old English Baron was extremely popular in its day. And then Anne Radcliffe's novels kind of grew out of that tradition. So early Gothics are quite different than what we're going to talk about soon. Um, 
a little different than what we're familiar with post Jane Austen. Most of them had a medieval setting. The Castle of Otranto is set in about 1300, I believe. The Old English Baron, about the same. Uh, Anne Radcliffe's early novels are all set in the 17th century. And they liked the medieval setting because authors and audiences felt that it was easier to suspend disbelief when they had you know, ghosts or uh, castles with chains or throwing people in dungeons and, you know, things that were a little less civilized than what they expected of 18th century characters. Um, Northanger Abbey changed all that. So interestingly enough, Northanger Abbey is really the only Gothic novel from that period that people still read just for enjoyment because they're Jane Austen fans. Um, I think it's only because of Northanger Abbey that Udolpho is really remembered at all. Um, because not only do the characters discuss it at length in the story, but Northanger Abbey was sort of conceived as, some people think it was a parody or a way to um, you know, insult um, Anne Radcliffe, but it really isn't. It's, it's actually uh, a kind of a, a genteel pastiche, I guess is the only way you would call it. And, and it's, it admires Udolpho. The characters all love the book. Um, even Henry loves the book. If Jane Austen had really wanted to poke fun at Northanger Abbey, she would have had Henry point out the various flaws of the book, but he doesn't. He actually says it's, you know, it's, it's a cracking read or whatever the language was at the time. Um, the other thing that Jane Austen did was she said it in her own time. So she kind of crossed it, crossed the Gothic with some of the types of domestic novels that we recognize as now Regency romance type novels. You know, the, the trip to Bath, searching for a husband, um, going to another person's house and hanging around for weeks at a time, you know, as a way to pass the time and entertain one another. Um, it was uh, kind of a, a new approach to a Gothic. The other thing that it did was it introduced a strong female protagonist. Uh, now, of course, you, you might think, well, Catherine Moreland is not a particularly strong character. And, and that's true, she's not at the beginning. But the whole idea behind the book is that she literally goes on a journey, you know, a, a journey to adulthood. So she leaves her home kind of a silly young girl, goes through a series of adventures, returns home a mature, soon to be married young woman. Um, and even her mother says, you know, you, boy, you used to be such a crack brain little thing. It's amazing. You know, you've, you've come home much more mature. So that Northanger Abbey really kind of set the die for some of the, the novels that came later. Uh, so moving into the 19th century, of course, the 19th century is often considered the golden age of the Gothic. And that's because Gothic was more literary during the Victorian era. We sort of have two strains of it. We've got the extremely popular type of Gothic, like Varney the Vampire, um, String of Pearls, which we also know as Sweeney Todd, uh, and, you know, a variety of penny dreadfuls with kind of outrageous situations and characters. But then we have the atmospheric literary productions like, of course, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, The Picture of Dorian Gray, The Turn of the Screw, and a number of other, what we call Gothic, uh, which have some romantic elements, especially Jane Eyre. But of course, they're about other things too. So they, they have sort of a, a couple of layers of meaning and they're not simple courtship stories. Moving on to the 20th century, our next big milestone is Rebecca, 1938. Um, of course, it was a very popular film at the time with Laurence Olivier and Joan Fontaine, who was also in the black and white version of Jane Eyre, which really you know, solidified the connection between those two stories in people's minds. Um, Rebecca's never been out of print. Um, it's still being adapted for TV and movies, apparently there's a, a, a modern version of it that recently came out. I haven't seen it, but somebody told me about it. Um, was not called a Gothic. It's called Romantic Suspense, right? Uh, Daphne du Maurier is also known for writing things like The Birds and Don't Look Now, 
which are eh, kind of, they have sort of some gothic elements, but they're, they're more suspense. Some people would even call them horror. So the popularity of Rebecca led to the creation of the seminal popular modern Gothic, Mistress of Melon by Victoria Holt. And I think it's safe to say that most people come to the modern Gothic because they read some Victoria Holt books. I know that's true for me. The first one I read was Lord of the Far Island. That was sort of my first Gothic and I still remember it because I enjoyed it so much. It was fun, well-written, uh, had you know great detail, great atmosphere, um, clever plot, you know, very entertaining, page turning. Are they great literature? Probably not, but you can't argue with popularity. And she really knew her way around the written word. She wrote under a variety of pen names. She wrote a lot of novels, hundreds of them. If you look at her Wikipedia, you can find a list of all the different pen names and types of books she wrote, mysteries, romances, gothics, obviously, historicals. Um, you know, I used to have books on my shelf by Jean Plady and Philippa Carr, and it never even dawned on me they were all the same person. Found out later, it was quite a quite an eye opener. Um, she created Mistress of Melon with an eye to the market. She'd been writing a lot for a long time and had failed to make the kind of money she needed to support herself. So she did some research into what sold, what she thought would sell. She took the name Victoria from the Queen and she took the name Holt from her bank, which was pretty wise. <laughs> you know, maybe that was the law of attraction. <laughs> they were using it back in those days. So it was a runaway hit. Everybody was reading it. Um, you see it here on the left-hand side of the screen. This is the original cover. And I think you'll see right away, this is a very, very familiar type of cover, otherwise known as the lady running from the house. And, castle in this case. It's got all of those traditional motifs, the lady running away in her nightgown with bare feet, the castle in the background, one window is lit up. This was very important. Uh, there was uh, one artist who forgot to light the window and the book went out without the lit, lit window and supposedly the, that one flopped and didn't sell. So what that means, nobody really knows. Is it symbolic? Is it uh, mysterious? Does it just draw your eye, you know, in, in the way that a good advertisement does? I'm not sure. Maybe we can talk about it later. Uh, but the popularity of Mistress of Melon led publishers to come up with a new type of novel that would be aimed at women. So the publisher who came out with them first was Ace and all Ace books, if you look on the spine, they all say first in Gothics. And they don't just mean first in Gothics as in our Gothics are the best. They may or may not be, but they were the publisher who created this genre, marketed it, came up with the standardized cover and then everybody started copying it. So if you have collections of 60s and 70s Gothics, is kind of interesting just to spread them out and see who published them, when, uh, what some of the, um, you know, imprints on the cover are, um, you know, it's and and how many different presses there were, and and some presses had several different lines, they had, you know, medallion gothics, they had cameo gothics, which are advertised as the best of the best, and they had queen size gothics, king size gothic, everything all kinds of special lines and, um, you know, it, it was just a, a marketing blitz and it worked. They also were smart because they put these books where women shopped, supermarket racks, drug stores. Uh, the covers were designed to compete with magazines in, you know, newsstands and things like that. So you'll notice that you know, they're very eye-catching. The art, they put a lot of effort into the art. Um, and th that was sort of a, a new thing. Worked very well. Content-wise, mm -hmm. most of them have very similar types of plots to Jane Eyre and Rebecca. So you have 
a young governess or a young bride traveling to a very imposing house. And the house always has a name. The protagonist does not always have one, right? You know, in Rebecca, the main character doesn't have a name. And in the turn of the screw, the governess doesn't have a name. But the houses always have a name. So some people say the house is actually the main character in all these stories. There is a case you can make for that, as we'll get into. A lot of people think that Wuthering Heights is a typical Gothic romance, but that's because they've only seen the movie versions that tend to stop in the middle after telling the story of Catherine and Heathcliff. But of course, the real novel, that's only the midpoint and the rest of it has to do with the cleansing of the, the houses by the younger Catherine. So one thing that people did pull from Wuthering Heights was this idea of the strong um, heroine or, or a, even a domineering heroine in some cases um, being torn between two suitors, a Heathcliff and an Edgar. So in some of the modern ones, she might choose the Edgar, but many times she ends up with the Heathcliff and tames him. So, um, you know, I think it's safe to say the Brontes are really the mothers of, of most Gothic fiction. And I, we can also say that Rebecca probably would never have existed without Jane Eyre. Um, it's got some pretty clear, um, you know, nods to, to the earlier types of stories like Jane Eyre, Mad Woman in the Attic and that kind of thing. So things went along pretty well for the Gothic until about 1972 when that era's Fifty Shades of Grey came out, The Flame and the Flower. The Flame and the Flower was one of those big, thick historical romances. It was sort of the first of its kind. It was sexually explicit. Uh, it, some scenes are still pretty shocking to this day. Um, there was nothing else like it on the market. And, you know, if you think about where the women's movement was at at that time, women were becoming more comfortable with their sexuality. Um, you know, birth control and abortion were becoming more common. Um, you know, there was a, an, an openness to a more sexually explicit kind of literature for women and the flame and the flower really grabbed the public imagination and bookstores started to stock those kinds of books instead of gothics. So the gothics kind of got pushed off the shelf some authors said that the Gothic was still popular, but just because it wasn't distributed as energetically as it had been, uh, the sales kind of dwindled. So it's sort of a vicious cycle. People would say, well, the Gothics aren't selling, so we're not gonna stock them. But if you don't stock them, they certainly won't sell. So um, one way or another, it kind of got pushed aside. There were fewer and fewer of them. Finally, in 1993, uh, there was a line called the Zebra Gothic and that went under and that was it. So even though you do see gothics now and then this kind of like special throwback storylines and things like that, uh, you, you won't see um, a line of books that are uh, you know, designated as gothic. So that's why I ended the, the book uh, in 1993 because that was sort of the, the end of the line for the, the mass market gothic with that label. And here you see one of them, the lost Roses of Ganymede House. Um, it's one of the last ones. You can see it's got the traditional woman running away from the house, but um, it's 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 different, right? It's it's modernized in a way that's just kind of less appealing than those old-fashioned ones. And this one, there was a little brouhaha about it because apparently there are no roses in it and they're not lost. And uh, Ganymede House, you know, the the word Ganymede has some unusual connotations to say the least for a romance novel. Uh, so here are some pulp novels. And again, these are something that people are, are more interested in now than they used to be. Uh, they're, they're sort of a uniquely American art form, both the covers and the types of stories. Mickey Spillane, obviously, you know, one of the few that has stood the test of time. Um, but you can see that these are completely geared toward men. And there's a reason for that. They were originally conceived as cheap entertainment for the troops. So they were sent overseas with the soldiers in World War II. And when the men came home, they wanted to keep reading them. So they kept pumping them out. So they, they were very big in the late 40s and early 50s, but very much geared toward a male audience. So the publishers thought, 
you know, uh, maybe we could come up with a similar type of novel that women would buy, you know, um, women were becoming more economically independent. They had some spending money of their own and they were looking for, just as they had been in the 18th century, uh, some entertainment that they could use in the home, right? It's, it still was not as common for women to work outside the home. So this was something they could read during leisure time. All right, so here's the Mistress of Mellon. Um, and again, just to point out the standardized cover. Um, and so you see how it's not called a Gothic, the famous bestseller suspense novel. So that Gothic label came later. Now here's one of the first ones. Um, and you can always tell how old they are by the price. So they started off, you saw that the pulps were about 25 cents. This one's 50 cents. So that shows you it's from the 60s, right? What do uh, paperback books cost now? You know, $8 US. Uh, so 50 cents. Um, and what I thought was interesting about this one was the blurb. Innocent and alone, she found herself fighting the forces of Middle Ages witchcraft. So there's a direct nod to the original Gothic that were usually set in the Middle Ages. And then look at this next part, a novel of romance and terror in the Victoria Holt tradition. So you can see the, the advertising right there. If you like Mistress of Melon, you've got to read this, right? And I also love the cover on this one. I like the angle. Um, the sky is very interesting. And sure enough, there's the Victorian house in this case with the single light burning. This one's a little more creative than some of the ones you get. Um, that are very standardized. This, you know, the, the art of these is um, quite beautiful in many cases and um, people love it. You know, in the earlier session we did, everybody was talking about the covers and how nice the art was. And, you know, you can actually buy these paintings. Sometimes they surface on eBay, the original painting uh, that was used for the cover that the authors, I mean, the uh, artist's family will have inherited the paintings and every now and then you see one selling. So it is theoretically possible to own the original of one of these covers if you're so inclined. They're rather pricey though. So at the beginning, a lot of the paperback gothics were from British authors. Um, one exception to that was Phyllis Whitney, who was um, one of the first American authors to really make it big in the gothic field. Her publisher contacted her and said, you know, we're starting this line of gothics and by then it had a name, but they didn't have any books for the line. So they commissioned a few and uh, the Quicksilver Pool was the first one that Phyllis Whitney published as a gothic. Um, you'll see it's the ace first in gothics, right? She published this one as a hardback in 1955, but was able to sort of repackage it and put it back out on the market and it took off. So she was kind of the most popular American Gothic author. And then I put this other one from her too, because I like the uh, the guy in the background, right? That's another motif you see sometimes. You'll see the house, uh, the light in the window. Um, occasionally you'll see the mysterious male figure lurking. And you do in this one, um, he's sort of vaguely threatening. You never really know whether it's the hero or the villain or both, right? Sometimes they're pretty interchangeable. Um, here's another author who was able to make it big, um, Virginia Kaufman. She's sometimes referred to as the mother of the Gothic, even today. She was incredibly prolific, put out hundreds and hundreds of books over her lifetime, not just Gothics, but other types of romances too. Uh, Mora was one that she had written when she was first starting out. And she was trying to pitch it as a Gothic in the late 50s. And according to her recollections, every publisher she took it to said, we can't market a Gothic. No one wants to read those, you know, maybe rewrite it as something else, a history or some historical or something. But she kept it the way it was. And then all of a sudden the market caught up with her, right? As sometimes happens. So this was published and the Mora series um, was one of the most popular Gothic series. It went on for like, I don't know, five or six books. 
and it made her fortune. She was able to quit her job, become a full-time writer, and uh, it continued right on through the 1970s. And I'm, I'll show you a later, more volume uh, in a bit. So here are just some different covers, um, just sort of picked at random, but, you know, take a look at the elements they all have in common, right? And there's one that's kind of unusual in the middle there, the dark sun at midnight, uh, the young woman's wearing a pantsuit. So that, that's something a little different, right? You don't often see that. Uh, a lot of them are, you know, running barefoot as usual. Um, you see a few of the brooding male figures in the background. Um, they all have the house with the light on in the back, right? Uh, oceans are another really common motif. It's kind of funny because in some cases when you read the book, there's no ocean in it. It's, a, it's not set on the beach at all, but the cover shows, you know, roaring waves and, you know, <laughs> but it's just a, a very common um, element that they would put in the art. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting about these covers is that in many cases, they have nothing to do with the story. So people often say, oh, all of those Gothic romance novels are the same. And the stories themselves are not the same, but yes, the covers are very much the same. That is a marketing gimmick. And in some cases a trick because you sit down to read the book and lo and behold, there's really nothing Gothic about it. You know, they would recycle old 1940s mystery novels. They would recycle historical novels. Um, okay, maybe there was a castle in them somewhere, but you know, they're, they're not Gothic in the sense that you would expect. So it's not true that all of them are formulaic or that they're, they're all the same kind of story. How could they possibly be? Uh, if you collect these, you know how many there are. You can really never even complete your collection. There are thousands and thousands of them. Um, oh, and one thing I'd like to point out about this particular group of books, if you look in the top row, three over, uh, Deanna Dwyer, Legacy of Terror, uh, that is um, uh, Dean Kuntz, pen name, I believe. So. Um, so here's another one, Shadow of Evil. Again, that, that very common... Um, motif with the house, the light in the back, the brooding figure. This one has a cemetery. Um, the woman in this case has white gloves. That's a little different. Um, and someone last session asked, can you, um, can you track the same models on these as like you can with Fabio in, in you know, the historical romance? You actually can. Um, many of the artists use their wives and daughters and things like that as models. So you, you will see the same woman popping up on a lot of the covers if they're by the same artist. There are a couple of sites that are devoted to studying the artists and, uh, you know, putting together, you know, galleries of their covers and things. And I looked up some of the links to these sites. So I'll put them in the chat when we go to break, if, if you're interested in, in the covers. Um, so this one, I noticed it says original title, Invaders from the Dark, which almost sounds like science fiction or something, doesn't it? But um, it's, it's likely that this is another one of those novels that was sort of you know, rescued from obscurity, maybe a, an old 1940s or 50s novel of some kind and sort of repackaged. You know, they would put these covers on just about anything at, at one point because they were so popular that they didn't have enough manuscripts to meet the demand. So while they were calling people like Phyllis Whitney and begging, you know, can you send us some some Gothic novels, they were, you know, going through the files, trying to find some old ones. So some of them are quite disappointing, especially the ones that are pre-1968. Uh, and there's a reason for that, which we'll get into. Uh, here's another one, um, another really prolific author, Dorothy Eden. Um, and this one, you know, has the suggestion of ghosts. Most of the time, there were no ghosts in these early ones. There were no vampires. That all came later. It was more like Anne Radcliffe where, you know, the heroine would think that there was some kind of supernatural being stalking her, but most of the time it turned out it was somebody, you know, trying to scare her, uh, trying to kill her, playing a prank, uh, you know, Scooby-Doo type 
type denouement, as we'd say nowadays, you meddling kids. I almost got away with, you know, they pull the sheet off and it's the villain dressed up like a ghost, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that was actually a really common plot device. And that, again, that all changed in the later 60s. Okay, here's another one I kind of like. I like the perspective on this one. I think it's very creative. Um, and of course, they all had names, author names that were very gothic-y. Um, most of the time, that was, needless to say, not their real names. And a large number of them were men. But they were all written under female names. And you can research that. Uh, there are a couple of research books that you know, just document pen names. And um, amazingly enough, there were a few men who wrote under three or four different female names and really cranked these out. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, and here's two more. Uh, you know, these are kind of the typical barefoot in night clothes, right? They're always running out into a field or through the rocks or something. And they never take the time to put on a robe and slippers. They just run out in their nightgown. But um, right again, it's re really typical covers. Um, this is an ace, right? An ancient curse, a hidden treasure, and murder. So most likely a murder mystery, you know, dolled up with a little bit of atmosphere. Um, and here's another one I thought was quite creative: Lark Song at Dawn. This one experimented with format a little bit, if you can look at the, the parts that are in green. Um, a zebra illustrated picture gothic. So yes, the same zebra that did the Lost Roses of Ganymede House. This would be one of their early 1970s or late 60s entries with 20 original illustrations designed with large type for easy reading. So the large type gothics, um, are another kind of subgenre. Um, a lot of people complain that the typeset was so small you could barely read them. And I can confirm that that's true, having tried to read those old yellowed, you know, very ancient brittle copies and having bad eyesight to begin with. Uh, they are rather restrained to read. So um, I suppose some of the older fans demanded larger type and some gothics were, were advertised that way. Um, and then I, I like this one because the, the color scheme is, is really cool, I think. Um, this time she's inside the house. It's, again, it's a bit like Mistress of Melon with the stairs, right? Um, and one thing I noticed right away was the pen name here, Marie Eyre. Uh, no doubt the descendant of Jane Eyre, am I right? So, um, and again, Black Gable Inn, the house always, always, always has its own name. Okay, and then another um, popular type of women's literature at the time was called the Nursey. And here you see an example of that. And these were medical dramas, you know, sort of like today's, uh, you know, TV stories, uh, ER and that kind of thing. Um, and they were romances, they were, unbelievably sexist. I mean, there's a site that reviews them. Um, she's passionate about them the way we are about Gothic. So she catalogs them, she reads them, um, and she summarizes them and, and, you know, kind of critiques them on her website. I'll put the link up if anybody's interesting, but um, it, it's, um, it's a real fun site. But these were basically the only kinds of romance you could get in the, um, in the bookshop or the supermarket or whatever in those days. So the nurses and the gothics. So needless to say, they crossed over. A large number of the authors wrote both. So I, I suspect they would just sort of take one of the nursey plots and like transplant it from a hospital into a manor house. It's actually a pretty good way to get the heroine into the house, right? You need the young woman who's alone in the world, um, trying to eke out a living. Um, so she has to live in the house, right? Um, because she has to be on site to poke around for clues. And if she's not a young bride, then she would have to be 
a governess, a housekeeper, a secretary or something like that. But a nurse works perfectly, right? Because the nurse might be hired to take care of the ailing matriarch or patriarch who might be being poisoned or something like that. Uh, you know, and inevitably the patient will have a handsome son or nephew who could become the love interest. So, um, you know, this was a really common kind of, but, but if you look at this one, it's the same cover. Um, it's just transplanted with a woman in a nurse uniform, right? She's running away and she's got her nurse uniform over her nightgown. So good for her. <laughs> she's always ready. Uh, romance and terror awaited nurse Nancy on her first private case. So these are the private nurses for the, the very wealthy. Um, okay, and I love this one because here's Northanger Abbey, right? Our, our traditional classic Jane Austen story. Um, and it's been dressed up so that it looks like a typical 1960s Gothic. And if you look at the cover and the blurb, you'll see this has nothing to do with Northanger Abbey. The terror of Northanger Abbey had no name, no shape, yet it menaced Catherine Morland in the dead of night. Okay, so if you've read Northanger Abbey, you might be hard pressed to remember the chapter where there was a shapeless, nameless demon drifting through the walls, like possessing her. And that's because it didn't happen, right? There really is nothing like that. I mean, the, the main terror there is that uh, she's worried that General Tilney might have killed his wife and she finds uh, what turn out to be a group of laundry receipts hidden in a trunk. And that's, that's about it. So, um, although I think it's a great idea that there's some kind of supernatural being chasing her through Northanger Abbey, um, it didn't work. So this is just another example of how they would take, you know, a, a well-known or a public domain manuscript and sort of, you know, repackage it and try to, I don't want to go so far as to say trick people into buying it, but um, coax people into trying something a little different maybe on, under the guise of a gothic. Um, and then this one is a, a parody that came out in 1968, uh, Mercy at the Manor Manor, um, a gothic spoof, Hester Jane Mundus, um, who was apparently a writer for The Tonight Show or something like that. She was a, a TV a comedy writer. She was very well known in her own time. I had never heard of her, but I looked her up and that seems to be the truth. So the blurb on this one, if you can't read it, says, as unlike the novels of Mary Stewart and Daphne du Maurier as you can get. So, you know, it's just poking fun of that whole, um, you know, if you like this book, you'll surely love this one. Um, and I don't know, it's got a kind of an interesting cover. Uh, looks like she's got the, uh, the needle from Seattle and on the back there and behind the house. The house does have the lit window. Um, she's wearing her go-go boots. The blurb is, could a beautiful young bride brought in from the coast of Brooklyn be completely unaware of everything? You bet. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's rather cute. I mean, I don't know, I recommend it. I, d I did enjoy it. It's, well, you know, not the greatest humor, I suppose, but you know, it works. So the, uh, the hero is an accountant in this book. And there's a line that says, you know, when she watched him adding up the figures in the ledger, she just couldn't contain her passion or something like that. So it's just, uh, kind of funny. Okay, so um, I thought we might take a little break here. So I'll stop the screen share and take a look at the, no, <laughs> all right. Okay, so, uh, now we're at 1966. So um, the world changed for the Gothic romance in the, in the United States, at least. Um, I don't remember this too well because I was only one year old, but um, I do remember the great popularity of this show when I was around kindergarten age, in the late 60s, early 70s. So the idea behind Dark Shadows was um, since women were buying Gothic novels at a breakneck pace, why not film some of them for TV? So they took some of the basic plots, uh, the naive young governess, 
the scary house on the coast, uh, eccentric family with secrets, um, you know, there's bodies buried all over the estate, which, you know, they would solve the mysteries over the course of several weeks. And, and it was a daily soap opera. Um, they put it on the air. It was black and white at first. So it had that look of, you know, the old um, Universal Studios monster kind of films. Um, and it was a huge flop. Nobody could figure out why. So the producer, Dan Curtis, um, asked his children, he said, hey, you know, why do you think people aren't watching my show? And the children said, well, it's obvious, dad, you got to make it scarier. So he said, oh, okay, I can do that. So the network was about to cancel it. They had about, I don't know, some set amount of time, like 10 weeks to turn the ratings around or be canceled. So they said, why don't we do something really off the wall? They dabbled in ghosts and other types of supernatural characters, very subtle. They said, why don't we rip kind of rip off the plot of dracula and bring a vampire in we'll have the vampire kill off some of the characters and then we'll stake the vampire through the heart maybe it'll be sensational enough to bring in viewers so they did um here's one of the tie-in books so the idea was um they'll do the woman running from the house books people who read the books will watch the show people who watch the show will buy the books of course this was in the days before you could buy anything on videotape. So it was on once and that was it. So it made sense that, you know, they might buy the books. Um, and here we have a really classic woman running from the house. Um, she was smart enough to put on her coat and shoes, although they seem to be high heels. So I don't know how far she's going to get, but um, Victoria is stalked by four menacing strangers through the grave-like halls of sinister Collins house. So they used to call it Collins house in the first season. Later it was changed to Colin Wood. Um, and then they brought on um, the character of Barnabas. So he was the, the vampire. Um, they hired a stage actor. Uh, he was 42 years old at the time. Um, he was just looking for a quick job. So he could earn some money. He was gonna leave New York and go to California to take up a faculty position teaching drama. Uh, in sunnier climes. So he just took this as a short, you know, gig. Um, all of a sudden, the show rocketed. People loved this character. Um, he was supposed to be the villain. All the women watching fell in love with him. He got love letters by the truckloads. Um, he had never been on TV before, so he would kind of stammer and muff his lines now and then, and people would write in and say, oh, it's just brilliant how you showed how the vampire was so nervous about getting caught. What a brilliant performance, you know. So anything he did, people just loved it more and more. Uh, you know, he, he, um, he recalled many years later that, you know, the producer said, I want to see you in my office right now. And he thought he was about to get fired because he was very poor at remembering his lines. And, you know, they um, they didn't do more than one take because soap operas were such a, you know, a low budget medium. So if you watch the show on DVD now, you can see a lot of bloopers. So he was sure that he was going to get fired. And, you know, the producer said, well, we want to offer you a contract for several years and we're going to make you the hero of the show. And so that's basically what they did. It just turned around. So Here's um, an ad for after the show had shifted. Um, now the vampire's the hero. They got rid of the governess character. Um, she left and they didn't replace her. Um, he had a series of women that he was involved with at one level or another. Um, he never killed anybody. Um, he was very guilty about being a vampire. He did strangle a few people, but he never killed anybody by biting them. So he, he did bite some of the women, but they were completely on board with it. And, you know, nothing, nothing bad ever happened. So he's, he was portrayed very sympathetically. And then they came up with a character of a lady doctor who fell in love with him and wanted to cure him. And again, that was the result of a blooper. Uh, they were going to bring in a male character named Dr. Julian Hoffman. Somebody made a typo in the script, so it said Julia Hoffman. So they said, oh, well, we'll just roll with it. So um, this was sort of a whole new thing. And um, that comes up in vampire films now. You know, there's, there's some, some, sometimes a doctor or a scientist or there's some kind of a way they can, uh, you know, give the vampire special medicine or something so that they're they can control their their blood urges and of course true blood is sort of the same kind of thing um so anyway the, the show was extremely popular and the books started to sell along with other types of 
marketing materials. So here are just a few examples of that. There were comic books, record albums, um, bubblegum cards. There was a board game that I remember receiving for my fifth or sixth birthday or something like that, um, which my parents checked out. It's now worth lots of money. Thank you, mom and dad. Um, there was a cookbook, as you see in the middle here, which is hilarious, right? Um, Barnabas's beastly beverages, Quentin's ghoulish goulash. <laughs> um, but the main reason that I bring this up is that these books changed uh, the gothic publishing industry. So you see a, a little selection of the books over there on the bottom left. There were 33 of them. Um, they were not great books, but they were very popular. Uh, the author, Dan Ross, who wrote under the name Marilyn Ross and also the name Clarissa Ross for his um, other gothics and nurses, um, supposedly sold something like 100 million copies of this book. So he, it made him rich. Um, he died a few years ago, but uh, I used to go to the Dark Shadows conventions in the 80s. And one day I was um, chosen to have dinner with him and his wife and some other fans won a raffle or something. So I, I did get to meet him. It was really interesting. It's one of my favorite memories. Um, and of course I never knew then that I would be doing all this research into Gothics. I was only, I don't know, 19 or 20 at the time. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of a little thrill when I look at his books now and I have, I'm using them for my research. I'm like, I met that guy, you know? Um, but he, uh, you know, he really um, changed, uh, maybe infused life into Gothic publishing. So here's one of the later ones. And you can see how they've changed from that first woman running from the house. So now, you know, she's out, they got rid of that character. Now it's all about the vampire, right? So of course this had an effect on other Gothics. Uh, there was a knockoff series called Strange Paradise. Um, also had a series of books. Um, and you can see how similar the books are. They're the same color and everything. Um, Strange Paradise never really took off in the same way. It just wasn't as good, but you can see they were trying very hard to uh, get that same audience to read them. Um, and here's just a, you know, a, a book that's obviously from about the same time period. Uh, the house even looks like Collinwood. Um, the female character on the book looks just like one of the female characters on the show. Um, Tina Halliday knows vampires don't exist until she discovers that the man she is about to marry has the vampire curse. So it's like a plot straight out of Dark Shadows. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I've read this one, but I, I would tend to suspect that the vampire is presented sympathetically. Um, and uh, I mentioned Mora, the Mora series, which was one of the early ones. Um, here's one that came out around 1971 or two, clearly trying to capitalize on Dark Shadow's popularity. Uh, the man in the back looks very much like Barnabas from a distance. He's got the same coat as Barnabas would wear with the shoulder things, flaps, um, the bats and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, he looks a little bit like uh, Frank Langella's Dracula, but of course this book came out before that movie, so it's just a coincidence. But somebody said he looks a little like Elvis too, which, but that's the point, right? He's he's sexy. Um, he's not a scary, mean vampire like Varney the Vampire. If you've ever seen that famous cover from the Penny Dreadful of Varney, he looks like a, a you know a, a rotting corpse basically. He's he's a real ghoul, um, and and all of that change in the vampire to a softer romantic hero who who can be threatening but can also be tamed by the right woman um, is very much the result of the popularity of dark shadows right um, so you know I, I would say these vampire heroes are direct descendants of Heathcliff and Rochester filtered through some television popular culture and things like that. But, you know, Barnabas Collins was, as far as I know, the, the first vampire hero. The show became about him. It was sort of from his point of view. And although he occasionally did despicable things and he was never actually the hero, you always sympathized with him and you always wanted him to win. So when somebody was chasing him around with a stake or something, you, you didn't want them to succeed. It was 
complete opposite of the older horror movies, you know. Um, and then here's another one. Um, here's the woman is not running away from the house. She's swimming away from the house and not doing a very good job of it. Um, I don't think I've ever seen another cover with the woman underwater. Um, but the reason I like this one is because A, it's different and B, that Diablo manner, right? Um, you, with Dark Shadows being so popular, you start to see a lot more uh, outright references to supernatural goings on, characters, um, situations. And in the early 70s, there was a lot of interest in the occult in popular culture. Um, the Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby were big popular films. You definitely see plots kind of swipe from those movies creeping into gothics. People were also big into astrology and things like that in those days. Um, here's um, a different uh, kind of gothic. This is the only one of its kind that I've ever seen anyway, and it has an African-American heroine. Um, and it has, it, it's almost exclusively populated by African-American characters. Um, it's, it's an American setting. Uh, witchcraft and the devil were part of her family heritage, a heritage from which she could not escape. So um, it's got witchcraft and things which, you know, again, Dark Shadows influence. Um, so this is from 1973. Um, and she also was smart enough to put on her coat and shoes before she ran out into the swamp. So that's good. Um, so this one um, was a, a very controversial um, supernatural Gothic, right? If you look at the top right corner, look at that uh, little emblem, a satanic Gothic with a goat head. I mean, think about that. I don't think you could market that even today. Somehow they got away with it. And this was a really popular book. Of course, the more controversial things are, the more people want to read them. Um, this is the one I think was probably inspired by Rosemary's Baby. Um, you know, people were, were fascinated by satanic cults and things after Rosemary's Baby came out. So if, if you're not familiar with that film, uh, Mia Farrow plays this character who is chosen to bear the devil's child and she has this uh, rather uh, milk toasty husband who goes along with it because he's a struggling actor. So uh, in order to achieve success in his career, he sells his soul, right? But the devil doesn't really want his soul. He wants to have a, a baby with, with Mia Farrow. So, um, so there you go. <laughs> it was very popular, but um, the satanic gothics were a line. There were, I think maybe 12 or 13 of them or something like that. Um, later on, they reprinted them and took the satanic head off it. I, I think that was a bridge too far maybe. Um, but what I like about this one is that the pen name, Louisa Bronte, right? So she's sort of presenting herself as a long lost Bronte sister. Um, we know who this author is. She was actually a, a middle-aged, uh, very conservative type um, librarian and her parents were missionaries, which I, I think is really interesting. Um, and you can look this book up. It's been republished under her real name, which escapes me at the moment. Um, but she wrote a series of these. This one, um, look at the way it inverts the woman running from the house, right? She's not fleeing for her life. She's setting up her own cult or something. You know, she's lifting up her hands like she's inviting people to kneel at her feet and, you know, make her their leader or something like that. Um, you've got the uh, castle with the light on. Look at the lightning and um, almost like Frankenstein's castle and the lightning, you know, brings the monster to life. It's a, it's a really interesting cover for many reasons. Um, she's in full control. And if, I don't know if you can read the blurb, but it says, on her honeymoon in a Balkan castle, Sophia made a pact of passion with the devil. So again, very much like Rosemary's Baby. Um, and this book, um, I wouldn't say it's sexually explicit by today's standards, but a little more than you would have normally have seen in those days. So it, it was a little bit risque. 
um, she's in this castle with her husband and although the book doesn't come right out and say it, he's not satisfying her in the way a husband should. So this count who runs the castle, I think that her husband's a diplomat or something. He's negotiating with the count and the main character undergoes like hypnosis and um, you know, this, this man sneaks into her bedroom in the dark and I mean she has a better time than she's ever had in her bedroom let's just put it that way and you never know whether it's her husband or the count and it's it's all very mysterious and um you know people loved it it's one of the best-selling gothics of all time um, and again this this made the author's fortune so she was um very much assured of a career as a writer after this so but she used the Bronte name to do it. So <laughs> supposedly, uh, you know, makes you think she might be a descendant of the Brontes. All right, and here's um, one of the astrological ones, um, a Zodiac Gothic. So, you know, in the early seventies, people were really interested in astrology and stuff like that. It was kind of a craze. So they tried to get in on that. Um, and this is Marilyn Ross, the, uh, the Dark Shadows author yet again. So another type of Gothic that came out in these times was uh, comic books. So they had illustrated Gothics. Uh, some of them were just like, you know, graphic novels, I guess we'd call them today. And then they also had prose stories, uh, you know, printed, you know, just as text. So they, I, I again, I, I want to say that Dark Shadows probably brought this on because as you know, they had comic books for that. So perhaps they figured there was some type of crossover audience, but these did not sell very well. They ended up changing the names. So you notice it was only 25 cents. Magazines are cheap in those days. Uh, Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love and then uh, Forbidden Tales of Dark Mansion. So I guess, you know, they thought reversing the title would help with sales, but it didn't. Um, none of these lasted too long. There are a couple of websites that reproduce these stories. So um, you can read them free. They're, they're scans or whatever, but they're out there. You just have to Google them. They come right up. Um, all right. And then this is another kind of groundbreaking book from 1979, 1980, Gaywick. All right. So here we have all of the standard motifs, the roaring ocean, the house with the light in the window, the brooding dark master of the house and lo and behold the innocent naive protagonist is a man so this was kind of a different sort of story nowadays you know male male romance is not unusual at all but wasn't wasn't real common in those days to say the least and it certainly wasn't mainstream the way this one was so uh, i like the blurb on this one he was so innocent until he fell captive to the brooding master and sinister secrets of Gaywick. Right. Um, so this was a kind of, it was sort of tongue in cheek. It used all the elements from the Victoria Holt books, the Bronte books, um, 18th century Gothics, um, it had some, some rather questionable, disturbing elements, um, but it was sort of all presented as campy fun. Uh, and it, it was very popular. So um, it just shows you another direction that, that gothics were going. So I don't know. I mean, someone asked in the chat, what happened to gothics? You know, what, what killed them? Maybe they just moved on. I mean, they, they went in so many different directions. It was impossible to, to unring that bell and go back to the, to the original, uh, more simplistic type of gothic. I don't know. But this was certainly a uh, an unusual direction for that time period. Okay, and then here's the uh, Harlequin version of a Gothic uh, or Mills and Boons as you call it in the UK. Um, you know, Harlequin slash Mills and Boons is sort of the big name in all romance. So you would think that they would have cornered the market on this early, but they didn't. They got into it much too late. These are very early 80s. And as you can tell by the price, 225, right? So as I mentioned, if you're ever in doubt as to whether it's an early or late Gothic, just look at the price. Uh, if they're over $1.75, it's a later 
a later Gothic. Uh, the, the early 60s ones are almost always 50 cents or 75 cents. This one's 225, so it's early 80s. You can sort of tell by the, the graphics and things too. Um, this lady looks like she's right on the edge of the cliff. She's about to drop right off. So, you know, the good old standard cover is almost humorous at this point. They've almost become self parodies. Um, and I haven't read this, so I don't know if the story's good or not. I would expect it's fine. I mean, Harlequin romances, you always know what you're getting. Um, you know, it's, it's popular to rag on them and say they're not good stories, but they are, they're page turners. I mean, they, they may not be great literature, but they always give you a good satisfying story that hits the right notes. So the story was probably fine, but for whatever reason, they missed the boat on these gothics. They did not have great success with them. It's a very limited series. These, it is possible to collect all of them. I have quite a few of them. Um, it's not that many. And there are websites, you know, where you can um, check off the ones you're looking for. So there aren't that many of them. Um, okay, and here are the zebra ones um, we mentioned. So these, these are the end. This is the end of the, the gothic publishing empire. Um, again, it's a limited series. There are not that many of them. I want, I want to say maybe 35 or something, if that. Um, they're almost parodies. Um, the Swirling Mists of Cornwall. Um, this woman's pose is just so over the top. She looks like she's falling into the, the viewer's lap, right? Um, the titles are very formulaic. It's always the something of something, right? The Ruby Tears of Bridge Cliff Manor, the Black Wind of Penrose Island. I mean, they're almost parodies. You, you, you know, Mercy at the Manor Manor wasn't so far off from these, right? And again, there's nothing wrong with the stories. Uh, in fact, the authors complained that the covers damaged their sales and misrepresented the contents. So they were not happy. Uh, a lot of these titles were put on the stories by the publishers. They weren't the author's choice of title. Um, but for whatever reason, they didn't take off. They weren't popular. So that was it, 1993 is the end. Um, they'd run their course and, and it was over. Okay, and then somebody asked about Twilight and here it is. Um, again, I, I would say Twilight is the descendant of Dark Shadows. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the vampire's last name is Cullen and in Dark Shadows it was Collins. I might be wrong, but Stephanie Meyer is just the right age to have watched Dark Shadows in its original incarnation. She's that generation, so it'd be hard to imagine she wasn't familiar with it at all. But, um, you know, it, it's... Um, it's not exactly gothic, but it's certainly in that tradition. You know, sympathetic vampires, um, they do anything they can to avoid biting the people. Um, obviously it's a, a romance between the heroine and the, the vampire. Um, and then from there we get to uh, the book everybody loves to complain about, right? The book that single-handedly destroyed civilization, <laughs> you know, as we know it. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey, and um, do most people know the origins of Fifty Shades of Grey, that it's originally Twilight fanfic. So Christian Grey was originally Edward Cullen, and uh, the, the female character here, I can't remember her name, but she was originally Bella from Twilight. So the author published this online as a fanfic, and her fans loved it and said, oh, you know, you should change the names and try to get it published. And uh, in fan fiction, that's called filing off the serial numbers. So you, you take the canon characters from the show you're fanficking about and just change them a little bit, change the world enough so that it's your own. Well, we should all write so badly, right? I mean, this woman is a, a billionaire based on this, this book. So I don't know, but um, Fifty Shades of Grey for good or bad is therefore a great, great grandchild of Mistress of Melon and a great, 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 great grandchild of Rebecca and Jane Eyre, right? You can trace a steady line through those books all the way up to Fifty Shades of Grey, which I think is kind of interesting. I mean, 
love it or hate it, it it's literary history right it's um there's a connection there all right and then this is you know a modern paranormal romance we've all seen these in the store um this one i think is kind of interesting because she's inside the house looking out right she's not running away from the house she's inviting the vampire bat in um it's just as easy to fall in love with the undead is the blurb so how far we've come right she's actually seeking the supernatural lover here and of course he's a millionaire so you can't really blame her in some ways but i just love this has the best title i think how to marry a millionaire vampire i mean nice work if you can get it that's all i can say and and you'll get to live in a castle so i think you know sounds good all right and then here's a, a very modern woman running from the house the um librarian at my college provided this to me and said, oh, look what I found. It's a, it's a modern version of that. Um, two lights on in the house, three, three lights on in the house. Um, it's just kind of funny. It's, it's clearly a throwback cover, right? And this is not a Gothic, but a mystery novel. So of course the mystery and Gothic are very closely intertwined. So interesting, I think. Um, all right. So I just want to briefly talk about um, critical views of the Gothic, um, academic attitudes toward Gothic romance. Um, when I was researching my book, I, I went back and looked at what had been written about Gothics in the original time frame. So I found this article from 1969. Um, Heathcliff doesn't smoke L&Ms, which I'm assuming is some type of cigarette. I don't know, but... Um, it, you know, it's got kind of a humorous, looks like an Edward Gorey cartoon, Raven Slop, right? Um, the, the guy on the, the, po the um, I don't know if he's standing on a gravestone or what, but he, he resembles the vampire from Dark Shadows, right? So this is clearly of its time. Um, and then writing popular fiction by Dean Koontz. This is sort of a, a, a classic of one of those how to write type things. Um, back in the 60s, um, I did some research into this too. Uh, the Writer's Digest magazine, which we might all be familiar with, uh, still around, and the writer uh, both had lots and lots of articles on how to write gothics. A lot of them were written by Phyllis Whitney. Um, she was a very sweet lady by all accounts who really enjoyed helping authors succeed. And so you look at her articles on how she wrote her gothics and she talked about them as a kind of performance. So she said, it's, it's not possible to write a successful Gothic if you're not a genuine fan of the genre. You have to, as she put it, really throw yourself into your performance. You have to become the characters while you're writing. Well, so then Dean Koontz, who, as you know, is a very successful author today in the early seventies, wrote this book, Writing Popular Fiction, not to take anything away from this book because it is a very useful writing book. Um, I've used the methods described in it, and I think they're, they're quite good. Um, but he has a chapter on how he wrote his Gothic novels, and it's unbelievably condescending. Uh, he's like, you know, he just comes out and says, I just did it for money. Um, I didn't, I wasn't making enough money on my science fiction, so I just tossed this crappy book together. I mean, he's just really uh, condescending. And I, I, this book was, it's still very well known. So um, it's out there, and I think a lot of people um, maybe take that at face value to and, and extrapolate from that that all of these gothics were just sort of these fly-by-night productions. They were just people like, do do do, just hammering out any old thing, which may have been true in some cases. But again, although the covers look the same, what's inside is not all the same. So uh, those are two, you know, kind of contemporary views of gothics and how to write them. Um, and then we get into some academic um, analysis. So the Joanna Russ article um, is still very well known. She was a prominent feminist sci-fi writer, if you haven't heard of her, um, died a few years ago. Um, and a good writer, not to take anything away from her talent, but she wrote this article in the early 70s and um, 
it really poisoned the critical well against the popular Gothic. Um, she took this one book by Susan Howitch, who is a much more successful author than Joanna Russ, by the way, and just went after every little detail, you know, uh, making fun of everything about it. And, you know, just right down to the level of saying that certain words were used too often. And she would count up how many times certain words were used and, you know, put the number of of occurrences of certain words, as though that proved anything, you know, it's crazy. And then she would go on about, you know, there was too much description of the food and the clothing and, you know, completely losing track of the fact that what was really going on was, you know, sort of cultural critique, um, you know, the description of clues so that the heroine could solve the mystery and things like that. It's like anything, if you take the details out of context, they may not look, you know, uh, well written or whatever, but in context, they work. And obviously, this book was popular, um, sold well. And Susan Howitch, after reading the article, said, I was blown away by it. I wasn't even writing a gothic. I was just writing a mystery novel. I don't know what, what this was all about. You know, so she, Joanna Russ just kind of took this one book. And this is common with academic commentators on the romance. They'll take one or two books, read those, find fault with them, and then say, well, this just proves that all of these books in this genre are, are bad or are, you know, have these things in common. Um, and, you know, nobody really questioned that until Pamela Regis came out with the natural history of the romance novel. That's one thing she mentions. You cannot characterize a genre by just reading two or three or even less books in, in that genre. You have to read widely, right? Which is one thing I did when I put my book together. And like I said, it was completely pleasurable, but I read, I, I don't know, probably 150 of those 1960s gothics. So I know they're not all like, you can't take any one and say it represents the whole field, it doesn't. Um, the other thing she says, um, these works are not related to the works of Monk Lewis or Mrs. Radcliffe, whose real descendants today are known as horror stories. Well, I think that's true of Monk Lewis, but it's not true of Mrs. Radcliffe, right? Um, I think without Anne Radcliffe, Jane Eyre could not have existed. And without Jane Eyre, none of these others could have existed. I mean, what Anne Radcliffe did was make the story about a woman. You know, the castle of Otranto had female characters, but the main character was the evil count, Manfred. It was not a woman's story. Um, there were two women um, who were secondary characters and one of them dies in the story. So, and the other one makes an unhappy marriage. So it wasn't a romance in the traditional sense. Uh, I think the 60s Gothic very much is, is a product of Anne Radcliffe. So I don't really understand why she would say that, but you see how once a critic says it, people sort of take it at face value and they, they don't always stop to consider whether it's right or wrong. Uh, then Loving with a Vengeance um, was published in 1982. Uh, it's still around, it's still in print and the subtitle is Mass Produced Fantasies for Women. So again, um, this, this book went uh, into uh, Mistress of Melon quite deeply in order to show that the experience of reading a Gothic romance or any romance for that matter is deeply dysfunctional. Uh, women are addicted to them almost like crack. Uh, they make you feel terrible and so you crave it more. I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not buying it. Um, and then of course, uh, Radway's Reading the Romance, which is the best known academic discussion of romance novels. It's, you read it now and you're shocked at how condescending she is. Um, she was a professor who got herself invited to participate in a reading group with a group of women who were, um, she makes very sure to describe as less educated than she is. Um, who have, in her opinion, poor taste. It was written in 1979. So, you know, there's a lot of description of the, the bell-bottom pantsuits that the women wear and things like that. So it's, um, it's somewhat distasteful if you, if you look at it uh, from a metacritical point of view. 
But um, all three of these were very, very influential in academic circles. Um, and then it took some time before some counter points of view were published. Um, one book I found extremely useful in understanding the appeal of the Gothic in popular culture is the Herbert Gans book, Popular and High Culture. He doesn't specifically discuss Gothics, but he definitely discusses the popular novel and why people read it and what they do with that knowledge once they've read it. And he points out that academics read books in a completely different way, right from the first page. Uh, they're looking for something very different than what the average reader who is just seeking entertainment would be looking for. And he also points out that no one really reads a popular novel looking for life guidance, right? Academics may do that at some level all the time. Um, they're looking at, you know, the structure and the context and all of these, you know, external qualities in order to place the work into, you know, the appropriate socioeconomic frame or however you want to express it. But the average person who's reading for pleasure uh, doesn't do that. Um, and then these other two um, books kind of built on that, Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women was published by um, an academic press, a university press. And it was the best selling book that the press ever released. Um, and in it, all the different uh, romance authors um, expressed why they write what they write and uh, kind of made a case for how their books are, are meaningful and helpful to women and why reading a romance novel is not in the least dysfunctional and how the romance novel celebrates uh, women's rights and women's intrinsic power and the ability of the woman to uh, you know, sort of triumph over patriarchy in a historical novel. And certainly in a Gothic novel, one thing the heroine does is cleanse the house, right? We were talking about the house as a, a character. Uh, it's usually a cursed character, right? So the house has uh, some kind of evil aura about it. In many cases, it's because, you know, a murder was committed there. Uh, there's one book uh, I read that, you know, the house... The house was um, the prized possession of some woman who had lived there in a previous century. But just like General Tilney, her husband was very cold and cruel. And I can't remember if she killed herself or she died in the house or some, for whatever reason she died in the house. And so, although there's not a ghost in it, it's this sort of this lingering pall of toxic patriarchy. So the heroine of the story, who's a very modern, um, you know, professional, um, you know, liberated woman um, takes over the house and, and the plot involves her sort of clearing away all of those cobwebs, you know, the, clearing away the evil. It's an exorcism in some ways, right? And the, the woman does that just, just through the power of her love. So um, that's kind of what these authors were talking about. You know, that that's sort of their their view of what a, a good romance novel does. It's, it's a cathartic experience. It celebrates women and their particular power in the world. It's a different from a patriarchal kind of power, right? A man um, or a male force in a story takes control of that narrative in a very different way than a female character does. So it's that fundamental misunderstanding that, that can lead um, critics to misinterpret what a romance novel is doing. Right, and then the Pamela Regis book is um, very groundbreaking. Um, I, I loved it. I would encourage everybody to read it. It just takes a whole new look at everything, starting with Pamela in the early 1700s, um, going through Jane Austen, the Brontes, and, and up into modern romance. Uh, there isn't much about Gothic per se, but you know, it's it applies to all romance equally. I would say. Um. All right, and then the question that we we touched upon briefly, will the Gothic return? So I was able to find a few examples of Gothics that are out there right now. Um, the Dead Travel Fast, which you'll remember is a line from, from Dracula and some other older vampire 
stories. Um, and it's not really about a vampire, but it's about a man who presents as a vampire and is suspected to be one. But it's actually, again, like Anne Radcliffe, everything has a, um, a mundane explanation. And it also, as I mentioned earlier, uses the plot of the original Mora. So when I was reading it, although it was very entertaining and well done, I thought, this is Mora. This is the same story. I've read this story. It, it, you know, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but if you read both of them, you'd know what I mean. It's, it's, it ends almost exactly the same way. Um, it was brought out by Harlequin. Um, and it was distributed. It was it was very easy to find. It was in all the bookstores and everything. Um, I don't know how well it sold, but she never followed up with any other gothics. Um, she turned to writing a series of mysteries instead. Um, Silent on the Moors is, is one title that sticks out in my mind. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how successful it was or if it was just a one-off that she was experimenting with. I'm not sure, but it is out there. It's, you know, it was a mainstream entry into the field probably about 10 years ago. Um, Crimson Peak, we mentioned. Um, here's the movie poster. You can see it's a, it's a takeoff on the woman running from the house. Well, now I look at it, I, I see why it didn't do so well. There's no light in any of the windows, is there? So no wonder. Now we know, we solved that. Um, and this one um, is very new. This is, it just came out. It's a mystery novel. Um, and it's a very clear takeoff on Rebecca, right? The last Mrs. Summers. I mean, we know Rebecca was the last Mrs. D. Winter, right? So, um, and I, I believe it, if you look this book up in, on Amazon, the description refers to Rebecca. It's, it says something like, a, you know, an homage to Rebecca, you know, by a best-selling author, something like that. So th there's no bones made about it. And you can look, just look at the cover, you know, you can see that it's, it's supposed to look like the original Rebecca um, film, right? With Mrs. Danvers, you know, in the, in the doorway. Um, and I just got this, so I'm really looking forward to reading it. I haven't read it yet, so I don't know what it's about exactly, but um, it looks good to me. Um, okay, and then another thing that um, I touched upon briefly was um, the use of Amazon Kindle as a vehicle to bring back Gothic. So Virginia Kaufman, whom we talked about earlier, um, died a few years ago, um, but whoever is in charge of her literary estate has reissued a lot of her Gothics, if not all of them, uh, as Kindles. So. Uh, occasionally I get fan mail uh, about my uh, Gothic Wave book and a couple of the people have mentioned that, oh, well, thanks to your book, you know, I downloaded some of these Kindles and, you know, so they're finding new life. Um, they're alive again. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, sometimes they're hard to find these days. You have to, you know, kind of root through used bookshops and things, but um, this is a way they can, they can be shared again with a new generation. So maybe this will bring them back. Uh, and then there are a lot of people self-publishing them. And this one caught my eye right away because you'll notice that the, the woman on the cover um, is the same one that's on the cover of my book. It's the same woman in a slightly different pose, same candlestick, same dress. Um, this is a, a self-published author. Um, she's got her own series. Um, Gothic paranormal is, is big right now, uh, more so than the, the Anne Radcliffe style where the Gothic uh, elements are all kind of the plot of the villain or something but uh, you know there's all kinds of them and and people don't have to worry about gatekeepers like Harlequin or Avon saying well this won't sell enough to put in stores they don't care they're just bringing them directly to the public so uh, they're out there and if you go to Amazon Kindle store and you type in gothic romance lots come up I mean good bad indifferent everything in between there's a lot out there so um, <coughs> indie publishing may be the, the next way it'll go. And they have a lot more freedom. You know, they can use same-sex couples. They can use, uh, you know, vampires and werewolves, ghosts, witches, anything they want, um, or none of the above. So, okay. And then, as I mentioned, this is the one I wrote uh, because I 
felt in order to really understand the genre, I had to try to write one myself. So um, this was my attempt and it's free to download this weekend. So uh, give it a try. Um, and if you like it, please leave a review. Uh, if you don't just delete it. <laughs> so um, free to try. So, okay, well, um, that about brings me to the end of what I had to say. So I guess we can talk and take questions.